well-regulated militia be necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards, the last Cam and Company of 2020. Can you believe it? When we talk again next week, the calendar will have turned. Hopefully 2021 is going to be a better year for all of us, but... uh, We're going to talk about the crime rate in 2020 on the program today because I have a feeling that this is going to be one of the major arguments that gun control activists use in the new year to go after our right to keep and bear arms. I want you to take a look at this tweet. This is from uh, uh, crime researcher Jeff Asher, and this was uh, Tuesday night on Twitter. Final murder update of 2020, the national murder update of 2020. Uh, He says, murders up. Almost 37% in 57 agencies with data through at least September. Uh, The most have data through November. Murder up in 51 of 57 reporting agencies. 37 of the 58 agencies report murder up more than 30%. Now, as Jeff Asher went on to say, uh, it is quite possible that we will see the largest ever one-year increase in the nation's homicide rate. He says the largest percentage increase ever reported, going back to 1960 anyway, uh, was a 12.7% increase in 1968. The largest percentage increase uh, in terms of you know the raw numbers, uh, 1938 in 1990. Uh, he says a 15% increase this year, and he says he thinks it'll be much larger, would mean 2,400 more murders and be the worst one-year increase in murder ever recorded. And he says you see this in cities big and small. He says, I'm not looking even at uh, places like Columbus, Ohio, that have set annual murder records, but I can't find the matching data for 2019. But what is interesting is if you go and you look at, and he's right, most of the major cities in the country have reported an increase in homicides this year. But most isn't all. And I, I thought it was fascinating that one of these cities that has seen actually the largest decline in homicides is Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. You look at this and you can see the numbers. These are uh, the the number on the left uh, is the uh, 2020 number of homicides. The uh, number just to the right is the number of homicides in 2019. You can see Oklahoma City at the bottom of the list there. Uh, 46 homicides through September 30th of 2020 compared to 58 homicides compared to uh, uh, September 30th of 2019. That's a 20% reduction in the homicide rate, in a state, by the way, that has constitutional carry on the books. I mean, Oklahoma is one of the best states in the nation when it comes to protecting the Second Amendment, and uh, Oklahoma City has not seen a rise in violent crime this year. Now, what's also interesting and worth pointing out is that Tulsa, Oklahoma, has seen an increase in homicides. Same state laws. Separated, uh, you know, these two cities separated by just about a 90-mile drive up Interstate 44. Oklahoma City has seen a reduction in violent crime. Tulsa, Oklahoma has seen an increase in the uh, shootings and homicides. So maybe, I know this is going to be controversial to the uh, gun control advocates out there, but maybe the gun control laws don't actually protect law-abiding citizens. And maybe more gun control laws is not the answer to reducing the violent crime rate. Give me another example. We talked about this. uh, I wrote about this at Bearing Arms this morning. Dermot Shea, the New York PD commissioner, uh, talking to reporters on Tuesday about the year-end crime stats in New York. And it looks like this is probably going to be the worst year for New York's homicide rate going back to the mid-1990s or so. You know, highest homicide rate in 25 years. And Dermot Shea said, you know, going forward, what the NYPD plans to do is to focus less on people who are just carrying a gun, even in violation of the law. And instead, they want to focus on the people, he said, that are pulling the trigger. So focus on those most violent offenders, those most prolific offenders. And don't worry as much about trying to, you know, round up everybody who's carrying a gun without a license. I, I, I Look, I think it's a savvy strategy, and we'll talk a little bit more about the idea of uh, focused deterrence in just a minute or two, 
But I was really struck by this. The Dermot Shea recognizes, all right, look, our gun control laws aren't preventing. He said people would be shocked to know how many guns are on the street. Well, I wouldn't because I know how black markets work. But it's worth pointing out that the NYPD commissioner says, look, well, in essence, he didn't come right out and say this, but in essence, what he said was our gun control laws aren't stopping criminals from getting guns. And we're making all of these arrests for illegal gun possession, and it, it it's not impacting the violent crime rate. Shootings are still up. Homicides are still up. So instead of just going after people who are illegally carrying a gun, we're going to focus on the people, again, who are actually shooting other people. Again, it's a wise strategy. But why not at the same time recognize that the average law-abiding New Yorker can't get a license to carry? There's no way for them to legally carry. So if all of a sudden now it's not going to be a priority to go after people who are illegally carrying a gun, why not take the next logical step and actually embrace the Second Amendment and make it possible for the average New Yorker to get a carry license? No, look, I, look I, I, I would love it if New York was constitutional carry, but I'm not crazy. Baby steps here. But that needs to be the next step. And it won't. I mean, absolutely not. Mayor Bill de Blasio, New York City Council, embracing shall issue right to carry. <laughs> not going to happen. But it should happen. Because even the New York police commissioner is acknowledging New York's gun control laws aren't preventing criminals from getting a hold of guns. But they are preventing law-abiding New Yorkers from exercising their Second Amendment rights. That's, that, I mean, that's completely backwards. The criminals are emboldened. The law-abiding citizens are disarmed. Nobody in the right mind can think that that's how it's supposed to work in New York City, but that's exactly how it's playing out. So, again, I think next year, gun control advocates are going to be looking at these crime rates and they're going to say, aha, this, this, is, this is our chance. This is our argument as to why we need more gun control laws. Look, 2020 was a record-setting year for gun sales. It was also a record-setting year for an increase in homicides. The two must be connected somehow. So we've got to go after the illegally owned guns, and then we'll see crime reduced. That's not how it works, and that's not what's going on. Uh, Peter Moskos is a uh, former police officer, uh, also a, a criminal justice researcher, and he's put together a really interesting project called the Violence Reduction Project. And he's basically asked for uh, a number of stakeholders, be it uh, criminal justice professors, uh, uh, law enforcement, um, even, you know, community activists. He, he, he asked them, all right, so what can we do to reduce violence next year considering the rise in crime in 2020? And I looked at and by the way, there are a ton of contributors. Here's just a partial list and, and what they talk about. And if you look through this list, what's interesting to me is that there are not a lot of people who are actually bringing up, well, we need to ban assault weapons, or we need to uh, go after magazines. We need to uh, ensure that people are, aren't carrying guns around. No. Uh, specific violence reduction strategies for the NYPD. Uh, violence interrupters reduce violence. Treat all gunfire, not just when a person is hit, as a priority. Doing so will reduce violence. Better police education and training are the key to reducing violence. Reducing violence needs to be the priority because before we can work on other social problems, uh, the political limitations of the causal story attached to hashtag defund. Again, these are not folks who are conservative, by and large. Uh, there, there might be a few folks on the right side of the political spectrum contributing here, but for the most part, you know, again, we're talking about academia. We're talking about researchers. Uh, citizens demand and deserve police services, solve cold cases. The one piece that jumped out at me in, in terms of, okay, here we go. This is the guy who wants to talk about gun control. Uh, it actually really surprised me because it, it, it's not the case. There's a guy named uh, Peter Nix, excuse me, Justin Nix. Uh, professor at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. And his piece was uh, titled Fewer Guns, Fewer Shootings. Right? And so, I thought, okay, here we go. Got to pass the gun ban. We got to make it harder to get a gun. But that's not actually what Peter Nix is describing. 
Uh, Nick's talked specifically about a program that was in place in St. Louis, Missouri, back in the early 1990s, called Consent to Search. And here's how he describes it. Uh, He says, at a St. Louis community meeting in 1993, a frustrated mother who suspected a nearby home was being used by teenagers to stash guns asked the police, why don't you just go knock on the door and ask the mom if you can search the house? From this suggestion, he writes, the Consent to Search program was born. The St. Louis Police Department's Mobile Reserve Unit, a small group led by Sergeant Simon Risk, simply knocked on doors in neighborhoods plagued by gun violence and asked parents if they could search the homes for guns. Sergeant Risk developed a, quote, consent to search and seize form, which promised that although officers would seize any illegal property they found, they would not make any arrests. The program's initial success was promising, to say the very least. In 1994, 98% of parents who were asked for consent to search their home granted it, and the mobile reserve unit ultimately seized 402 firearms that year. So why was it abandoned, asked Nix. Well, the short answer, he says, is politics. Now, constitutionally speaking, if you're asking for permission, okay, that, 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 that's constitutionally sound. Uh, but this, again, is a targeted approach, right? It's not like the uh, St. Louis police were just going door to door throughout the entire city saying, hey, can we search your home for a gun? They would go into the neighborhoods that have been plagued by violent crime, that have been plagued by shootings, and start knocking on those doors. Hey, do you have somebody, you know, you have a teen in the home? 15, 16, 19, 20, 22, whatever. Within that age range of the most likely to offend, do you mind? Are you, are you concerned about your kid? Are you worried about your kid falling in with the wrong crowd? Do you mind if we can we search your house? Not going to make any arrests, but if we find any guns, we're going to take the guns out of there unless, of course, you legally own them. Um, these types of programs, I, I would not, and I'd be very curious to know what you think. Is this what I just described to you? Do you consider that to be gun control? Because I don't necessarily consider that to be gun control. Again, we're not looking at restricting the rights of law-abiding citizens. We're not going after legal gun owners. We're not trying to impose restrictions on the right to keep or the right to bear. So to me, that doesn't fit the traditional gun control model because it's not actually about reducing legal gun ownership. It's not about infringing on the right to keep and bear arms. But I'd love to know what you think about this. Do you consider a program like that to be gun control. Because in my mind, programs like that, Project Ceasefire, which is sort of a carrot and stick approach to getting uh, people out of the gang lifestyle. Now, we've talked about this on the program before. Basically, you, you've, got, you've got two groups of, of the adults in the room, right? You've got the community members, moms, dads, parents, pastors, on the other side, you've got prosecutors, police chief, U.S. attorney, DEA, ATF agents. And they call in these most violent offenders, the ones who that they, uh, they believe are most likely to offend and most likely to be the victims of violent crime, too. And they say, all right, you're going to stop shooting. And we will help you if you let us and we'll make you if you don't. So over here is the help side. You need help with your GED. You want to get some job training. You need to, you know, whatever the skills are that you need to turn your life around. We are here to help. If, on the other hand, you keep shooting, no, you're going to run into these folks. And since most of you already have previous criminal charges, you've got previous felony convictions, uh, if we catch you with a gun, let's say, we're going to take this case up to federal court. You're not going to get a plea deal. You're not going to get time served. You're going to get five years in a federal penitentiary. And by the way, if uh, this is a you know repeat offense, you get more. And we're serious about this. We want you to know that we're serious about this. When those programs are put in place, when the promises are kept on both sides of the equation, with the carrot and the stick, homicides drop dramatically. Because again, there are consequences. And the risk calculation changes for the average young shooter in, let's say, Baltimore or Chicago or New York City. The problem well, there are so many problems with the, uh, the the gun control ideology. But in terms of a crime reduction strategy, 
one of the big issues, leaving the constitutionality of their proposals aside for a second, one of the big issues with the traditional gun control model is that it tries to reduce the supply of firearms in a country in which owning a firearm is protected under the Constitution. And in a country in which we have over 400 million privately owned arms, gun control is a supply side solution. Well, we can just get rid of the supply of guns and criminals won't be able to get them and then there'll be less crime. How how are you going to do that? Again, in a country that protects the right to keep and bear arms, a country that has 400 million privately owned firearms, how are you really, really going to address the supply? Instead, focus on reducing the demand for firearms among violent criminals. That's the real key. And how do you reduce demand for firearms among violent criminals? Again, you ensure that the consequences of using a firearm in the commission of a violent crime among these most violent prolific offenders comes with a real cost. And we know that this works. Project Ceasefire is not new. It started in Boston in the mid-1990s. It helped reduce the juvenile homicide rate by more than 50%. So I am heartened to see that a lot of these researchers are not talking about things like, well, we need to ban magazines, uh, or you know what, we need a we need a waiting period for farms. That yeah, for gun sales, we need a waiting period, or uh, we need gun rationing. We need one gun a month. Those ideas are not coming up among the criminal justice researchers, among the cops on the street, among the community activists who are looking at ways to make communities safer. By and large, they're not promoting the traditional gun control measures. That's a very good sign. The bad news is anti-gun groups, they're going to continue to push those traditional anti-gun measures. They're going to have allies in Congress. They're certainly going to have allies in the state legislatures in places like New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, California, Colorado, Washington State. So the fights that we will face um, are real. They are coming. But again, I think we can also anticipate some of the, the arguments that gun control advocates are going to use. And we can start to develop our rebuttals, which are not only, by the way, truthful, but will lead to more success in improving the public safety in these communities. You can't ban your way to safety. You can't arrest your way out of this problem. Well, I take that back. You can arrest your way out of the problem, but not by trying to make just as many arrests as possible. Again, you've got to focus on who's actually driving the violent crime in these cities. And if you focus the deterrence efforts on those individuals, that's when you'll see a result. Trying to fight violent crime by making it impossible for law-abiding gun owners to obtain a concealed carry license, or by banning the most commonly sold centerfire rifle in America today, or banning the most commonly owned ammunition magazines in America today, or trying to establish some sort of gun rationing limit. Those things don't work. They're aiming in the wrong direction. They violate the Constitution. And again, they're designed to disarm the public, which only emboldens violent criminals. So let's get to today's armed citizen story. Speaking of Second Amendment rights, uh, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report will start there with a, a story out of Utah where uh, police have arrested 33-year-old Christopher Lee Barros. They say he shot another man in the face at a gas station in Salt Lake City back on December the 4th, uh, arrested for investigation of attempted aggravated murder, aggravated robbery, mayhem, felony discharge of a firearm, possession of a weapon by a restricted person, obstruction of justice, as well as possession of drug paraphernalia and burglary tools. Uh, The shooting happened just after 6.30 in the morning on December the 4th. Uh, Police were called out to that gas station in Salt Lake City, uh, on reports of a uh, blue du- Dodge Durango and a, a guy who had gotten out of the uh, Dodge Durango stumbled across the gas station parking lot after he was shot. Uh, he was taken to the hospital in critical, uh, uh, excuse me, in critical condition, but uh, is expected to recover. Now, according to the uh, Deseret News, Barros has a criminal history dating back to 2007. And according to court records, it includes charges for drug-related crimes, but also for things like burglary 
and aggravated kidnapping. And police say that, yes, he was on parole uh, at the time of his arrest, which again raises the question, why was Mr. Barrows out on the streets and not behind bars, given his previous criminal history? Now, today's armed citizen story, a uh, great story from uh, Winsville, Missouri, where a, a woman able to foil a carjacking involving four kids. Yeah, this was uh, Saturday morning, about 7.30, in a parking lot on uh, off of a Winsville Parkway. Police said the victim reported that she noticed four people nearby while she was sitting in her vehicle. And uh, the four of them began to approach her car. Um, They demanded her vehicle at gunpoint. Police said that the woman pulled out her own firearm and refused to leave the vehicle. That prompted the teen with the gun and the other three suspects to flee. After officers arrived, they arrested a 17-year-old, two 15-year-olds, and an 11-year-old. Yeah, 11. Authorities said one of the 15-year-olds had a firearm. He was charged with attempted robbery. Other three charged with conspiracy to commit robbery. Obviously, the uh, woman, legal gun owner, not facing any charges. Thankfully, the uh, presence of that firearm in her hand was enough to stop that situation from developing any further. Uh, but again, yeah, yeah, and you know, we've been talking about consequences. You wonder what are the consequences going to be for trying to carjack this lady for these four juveniles? Are they going to get anything other than? A simple slap on the wrist. Finally today, our good deed of the day, also from Missouri, Boonville, Missouri, where a neighbor in the right place at the right time to uh, help out a woman escape from a burning structure. Uh, Boonville Fire Department says personnel from the police and uh, fire squads responded to a structure fire on Monday night. Officers able to gain entry to the residence. They found an unresponsive person inside. Uh, The officers were assisted in getting that woman out of the hospital, or excuse me, out of the uh, the burning home and to the hospital um, by Brandon Roberts. He's a neighbor. Uh, So they were able to get her out of that home. They were able to start CPR. She is listed as stable uh, and hopefully will be released from the local hospital soon. Police department says we want to commend our officers for their heroic efforts to save her life. We also want to commend Brandon Roberts for putting himself in danger to assist our officers and the female. His quick actions in assisting at the scene help to save a person's life. So in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Brandon Roberts there in Boonville, Missouri. We thank you, sir, for your very, very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you on this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. Again, thank you for tuning into the program. Thank you for being a part of the program throughout the year, by the way. This has been a... Crazy weird year for all of us, and I, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, I don't have a lot of hope that 2020 is going to be any better, at least in the near term, but I'm glad that we are in this together. I thank you for all of your support for spreading the word about Bearing Arms Cam and Company, and uh, we've got some exciting stuff in store at Bearing Arms over the course of 2021. We're telling you more about that in the days and weeks ahead, but I do hope that you enjoy a a very happy and uh, safe New Year's Eve. We'll see you back here next Monday with another edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company, the first of 2021. We will be uh, updating the website, by the way, throughout the long holiday weekend. So make sure you check out BearingArms.com for the latest Second Amendment news and information. And, of course, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube, Bearing Arms Cam and Company on Rumble. Also, uh, look for us on Amazon Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher. You'll find us there as well. Thanks so much for being a part of the program, for being a part of this community. Until we talk again, be well, be safe, and be free. 